It's interesting when you're saying that. I mean, like, I know that <clears throat> as an actor, obviously, just the industry, like, you had to deal with just rejection, just day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. Like, do you feel that experience was, in hindsight, was that was that an empowering or a disempowering for you? Because on the, I mean, it obviously seems like obviously just disempowering, like being told. But but did that just build up just like this bulletproof, like you know, ness? Or how how was that for you looking back? Uh, so I really appreciate that you ask about hindsight on that because that's that 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 hindsight perspective is really helped now. Yeah. <laughs> when I was in that business, I was not mature enough to handle it. I couldn't handle all of the rejection. It was too much. And that's one of the reasons that I left the business. Now, at the time, that's not why I left. I mean, <laughs> not if you asked me why I left. <laughs> but now, when I look back and I'm older and I've achieved uh, a few things in the industry that I'm in, I feel much more comfortably being honest about the fact that I could not stand getting rejected. I just couldn't do it. It's just, it was impossible for me to deal with on a daily basis. I just didn't think I would. I went to graduate school at NYU. I did, you know, one of the best uh, MFA programs in the country. I was, I had some hair then, so I was, I was okay looking, you know, and I was decently talented. I thought they're going to be begging me to work when, as soon as I walk out of the door at, at, at grad school. And that's not exactly how it worked. <laughs> And, you know, I did, I mean, I did have a modicum of success. I did, you know, a lot of the shows that most people know, but, you know, at that time, but it was, it, it was just, I couldn't handle it. Now, now it helps because now I know that if I give up on something that I, I really want, the only person that it hurts is me. That's it. And I really don't care that much about what others think at this point. You know, like if you get off this interview and you're like, ah, I hate that guy. <laughs> you're fine, Duncan, sorry, you know? I'm not gonna, the rest of the day be like, Duncan doesn't like me. <laughs> oh my God, I don't know what to do. I'm just not gonna do it because it's just a waste of time. So, so that's helped me now uh, go after the things I want more passionately and more assertively, not to pretend that I don't care. So I remember there was a, I was testing for the, for the lead role in Kiss the Girls opposite Morgan Freeman. It's kind of a big role. And it was for the cop who was actually the killer, which is perfect for me because I look like a cop and a serial killer. So tick, it would have been, tick, it was, perfect. Tick, tick, got it. Cop, serial killer, done. I always joke that's why I smile a lot because if I don't, I look like a serial killer with the bald head. So um, so yeah, so I went in there and I remember, I remember people were like, you must be so pumped. That's a huge role you're going for. I'm like, yeah, no, it's okay. You know what? It's not, I don't really love the script. So if I don't get it, it's not a big deal. If I, like, if I heard myself at that, I just slap myself. Such bullshit. <laughs> such bullshit. So, but this way, if I didn't get it, you know, I can be like, I save face. Well, I didn't really love the, I mean, I told you I didn't really want it that much. It wasn't that great a script. It was such bullshit. Uh, uh, and it just didn't hurt as much to me if I, if I pretended that I didn't really want it. And I didn't recognize that's what I was doing at the time, but I recognize it now. So I think that if we really want to do big things, we've got to be really open about how much we want it. We got to, you know, tell the world because it'll make us also work harder to go get it. Absolutely. So I think that I'm not sure what the heck I was answering, but, <laughs> but rejection day in, day out. Uh, like. Yeah. So it definitely helped. Now, the thing is, this is that I think we, you, you mentioned armor. I think I write about this in the book too, in Steal the Show, this idea that we often wrap ourselves up in layers of persona, not personality, persona, the idea of who we are supposed to be. Gotcha. And we think that's going to protect us. That armor to me is just parchment. Like I can poke right through that. And the reason that you often hurt when you don't get what you want is because you've put on this armor that you think is going to protect you. And then, you know, people just poke right through it. You go, oh, 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 you know, it's, it's uncomfortable. So, but I think the strongest, um, the strongest 
honest way of being is not wearing armor. Because, you know, if you believe in yourself and what you're doing, then your core is what's strong. And I don't mean a six-pack strong. I mean, nobody can take away from you who you are, what you believe, what you want. Nobody can take that from you. They can say no to you, but they can't take it from you. So you don't need armor. But if you have armor, nobody can get to you and you can't get out of it. You're constrained by what's protecting you. So your core, your strength, what you have to offer, it doesn't get out. So yeah. you're trapped. You're trapped. That's really interesting. So like, yeah, the Joseph Campbell quote, like the privilege of a lifetime is being who you are. That's in my Think Big Revolution keynote. That's exactly what I say. I say the privilege. The privilege of a lifetime is being who you are. That is a brilliant, brilliant thing. But you can be so many different things. You don't have to be one thing. Yeah. And that's, that's where the privilege is. And that's what we were talking about earlier, this idea that being who you are is not just one thing. It's not this rigid, uh, uh, true to self idea that once you know exactly who you are, you will never be anything different. I have no idea who I am. <laughs> I don't. What I know what I believe. I know what I like. I may change the things that I believe 10 years from now. Like my father's changed his political beliefs. People change things. Yeah. My mother doesn't like that my father's changed his political beliefs, but he has to change because that's what he believes now. And he's willing to do that. Perfectly fine. And I like to see them argue about it. It's actually quite funny. <laughs> but 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 that's that's my point is that I don't know this idea of who you are is such an amorphous concept. I know what you be, I know you can believe things, you can feel things, you can like things, you can resonate with some things more than others, you can choose the people you want to spend your time around. I mean all of these things say something about who you are, about your character, but this idea of deciding who you are is is such a I mean like if I said okay, uh, give me one sentence that is who you are. God. You can't do it. <laughs> I'm shit. just going to save you right there because you can't do it. I mean, you could have some sort of like mission statement of, you know, like, like I say, you got to have a who and do what statement for your work, meaning, you know, for your work, like why you do this. Like I get up every day to help people think bigger about who they are and what they are for the world. But I do other things. I like other things. Yeah. You know, sometimes I want to watch a really stupid movie that is not about thinking big. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm off brand. Yeah. Shit, I'm off brand. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally off brand. But nobody, nobody should know that I, I love the movie Hangover. It'll be off brand. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> One thing I found, um, I think it kind of tied in a little bit what you're talking about earlier um, about, well, I mean. It talks about authenticity, but then also as a performer, like you're showing like your best self, but you were really, um, I think it was in the um, Entrepreneur on Fire interview, like really brave about like sharing, you actually completely honest and sharing stories about like, you know, your struggle and battling with food and stuff like that. Would you mind just telling our audience a bit about that? Sure. I think that many of us have different things that we struggle with in our life. And sometimes it's emotional issues. Sometimes it's um, addiction issues. There's lots of things we struggle with. And often we feel the need to hide those things because it would be, as you said, off brand. You know, we think that people will judge us negatively and they may uh, from time to time. But it's harder for us, I think, at least I can speak from my experiences, it was harder for me to to feel that I deserved the rewards of my work when I was hiding a part of who I was. And throughout most of my life, I had trouble with overeating. Now I managed it well uh, by being uh, an athlete. So I trained a lot. Uh, you know, I was in martial arts for 20 years. When I was younger, I raced bikes and high school, I played football and baseball and all those things. And I would just tra chalk it up to, well, you know, I come from a Jewish household. They just eat. That's what you do. You just eat. 
You know, how do you feel? Ah, not so good. Eat, eat, you'll feel better. You know, that's so, but then over the years I found that it started to get harder for me to control it. Like I would start eating some cookies and then all of a sudden I'd be at the bottom of the bag of cookies. Like there just were not enough cookies for me. And I'd be like, I should have more cookies, but I'd already eaten a bag of cookies. I'm like, this is not good. And I started to put on some extra weight and I wasn't comfortable with that extra weight. And I felt really bad about myself because I wasn't able to control it, to stop it. And then I felt weak. And of course, I didn't want to go out and tell people that I couldn't stop eating food because that seems pretty weak, doesn't it? <laughs> Especially when they're in the business of trying to inspire other people to do the things that they want to do. So all of a sudden now I'm hiding something about myself. And I realized that I had a, a, a certain kind of addiction to food, just the way as somebody would to alcohol. And for people who don't have any trouble with food, they go, that's weird. But I don't really care if they think it's weird. People who have this difficulty with food uh, recognize that if they can't stop something, then it's an addiction. <laughs> yeah. Like it's compulsive and a compulsive behavior is a, an addictive behavior. So if I keep doing this all day long, you know, until I wear my skin off, that's an addiction. That's a compulsive behavior. I can't stop doing this. Right? Now, what if I did this for the rest of the interview? <laughs> for anyone who's just listening to the audio, just scratching your side of his head. <laughs> yeah, here you go. I'll play it. You You'd scratch through your whole skull. Yeah, so I'm doing it on the mic. I'll do it on the mic here. There we go. How about that? So, um, so in any event, the you know, the, the, the point is, is that I came to terms with the fact that I had that uh, problem. And then I was able to, to quote unquote, recover from it and then stay vigilant every day by staying away from certain kinds of foods that I know would trigger me. So I don't eat ice cream or cookies or things like that, because if I do, I, I want more of them. Simple as that. And and I decided, you know what, I, I should be honest about this. I should just share it because then I won't be hiding anything. And it felt really freeing, very good. I don't, I'm not uh, on a mission to share it with everybody. I don't generally share it in interviews. I don't generally talk about it. But if I'm asked about it, then I'll talk about it. So it's not something I wear on my sleeve. I don't feel the need to. But I've re received a lot of feedback from people who appreciated it because sometimes when you write books, when you give speeches and your job is to uplift the people, you sometimes can seem distant. You can seem like you're larger than life in some way or that everything's easy or you don't have any problems. And, and, uh, that is certainly not the case. Uh, and, and it just helps people recognize that, oh, I see the people that I admire are just like me. The people that are teachers are just like me and I'm just like them. So if I want to do something similar to what they're doing or they inspire me to do uh, something, you know, that means uh, something to me, then I believe I can do it. And, and that's, uh, that's been very freeing for me and for a lot of the people that I serve. So I think that if you're hiding, and <clears throat> interestingly enough, uh, one of the, I gave a, a speech a couple of years ago to a group of about 150 very, very high level people in business. And most of the people there were in the seven or eight figure range. God. And I talked about this idea uh, of hiding and the dangers of hiding. And I know there were a lot of alcoholics in that room, a lot of people, you know, who do drugs. I mean, just because the odds are, you know, the, the, the statistics will tell you people who have uh, other types of issues, you know, they're, they're cheating on their wife or, uh, they're bad, you know, really disengaged parent or whatever it is. Most people have something as, and as you get older, you know, these things usually get worse, not better unless you, unless you deal with them. So they, that group was the least receptive to my message. In part because the idea, I think, for a lot of them of embracing this, what they see as a weakness and being public about it, would be just too damaging to their reputation. And for some people it might. But there's nothing I could do about that. I just, you know, shared the message based on my experience and, and uh, you know, some people found it 
you know, uh, powerful and others were like, no, I'm not hiding anything. What do I need a message about hiding? I'm like, great. Then you're good. You're set. <laughs> I don't know why you're pissed about it. Cause you know, anyhow. So I, I, my point is, is that I think hiding is dangerous. Uh, and it uh, doesn't mean that you wear your challenges on your sleeve and make your brand about those challenges, unless that's the business you're in mm. for whatever reason. Um, but you know, if you're in the, if you're in the weight loss or health business because you had a big um, uh, transformation and that transformation is part of your story, which helps other people, then that's, that should be, you know, part of your story. It should be on your sleeve, but otherwise it doesn't need to be, but just for each one of us that we know we're being honest, yeah. uh, in the way that we're operating and the way that we're dealing with other people. And you say, I mean, I guess <clears throat> if you've got, you know, I think by, by doing that, you know, it, 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 will, it will attract the people who, you know, resonate with you and, they buy into you and your story and the people who don't, don't. And that's, and that's great. And they'll find somebody who they resonate with. It, it, it ties in with what you were talking about with um, the sort of red velvet rope policy, isn't it? When you yeah. almost, could, could you explain what that is? Well, the red velvet rope policy is the first chapter of, first of all, you do all your homework. This is really cool. <laughs> you, books, you watch the keynotes. This is great. I, I can't tell you how many times I've done interviews with people. they will be like, so um, tell me, uh, tell me w w about your books. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. I mean, if it's a brand new book and they haven't read it and it's not out yet, you know, I get that. But it's nice to, to talk to somebody who's really prepared. Thank you. So the first chapter of Book Yourself Solid is the red velvet rope policy. And the idea behind the red velvet rope policy is that there are certain people you're meant to serve and others that you're not. And our job is to do everything in our power to reach the people we're meant to serve. And full self-expression influences that greatly. If we water ourselves down, then we end up with people that we might not be meant to serve. And as a result, it becomes frustrating and, and un, unsatisfying for us and for them. And the red velvet rope is a filtration system that allows in your most ideal clients or customers. And, and we should have a red velvet rope for our personal life yeah, as well. Absolutely. You know, <laughs> it, this is where I got the idea. It's not, it wasn't a crazy concept, but I thought, well, why aren't we applying the same red velvet rope to our business. I mean, you're not just going to marry anybody, are you? I hope not. I mean, sometimes we do and it doesn't work out very well, but we're not going to hang out with just anyone all the time. Sure. I don't just randomly throw a dart at the wall and say, hey, why don't you be my best friend? It doesn't work that way. You choose the people that you spend the time with and hopefully uh, you're making the right choices. And I think actually many of us need to stop spending time with some of the people we spend with and make different choices. So our red velvet rope probably needs to get tighter in our personal lives as well. But uh, from a business perspective, I just think, especially if you start a business, you know, if you're selling for somebody else, you might be in a different situation, but if you have your own business of any kind and you work with people that drain your energy, frustrate you, bore you, or make you want to do bodily harm to them, then I don't think that's a great way to, to go about being in business because there's really no point in starting your own business if that's the mm -hmm. way you feel uh, day in and day out when you're working. Plus, you're also not going to want to go out and book more business if you don't like the business that you have. I mean, it's kind of common sense. So I say, let's free up the space so we can focus on the people that are ideal for us and go out and get them. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, it seems, it seems counterintuitive to turn away business to turn away money but like you said it i mean if those people are there taking up your time your energy your resource then then that is time which isn't spent on letting new people in who are like your dream customers who like you resonate with you love you know you could who is working with them is easy you know it's fun yeah it's absolutely and it's not it's not turning away business no. what you're doing every time you take a client it's an opportunity cost so if you do something that takes your time you're choosing that over something else. And if you're choosing something that takes your time and it's not a productive use of your time, like your, your domain issue yesterday, or whatever, <laughs> yeah. with, then that, that was not a productive uh, hour, two hours, five month contract, whatever. You could have gone out and booked some business that would have been a lot better. So if you take on a client that you don't like working with and you charge them $500 an hour. Well, why don't you go out and book a client that you like working with that you charge $500 an hour? I mean, it's not a complicated, it's really not, 
Like, I, you know, I don't, sometimes people push back on me about this idea, but to me, it's actually quite simple and kind of hard to argue uh, unless you feel that there's a tiny, tiny amount of business available to you. And that's thinking small. I think there are, I think I, I'm not a, I'm not a big, like, you know, the universe brings to you kind of guy, but I do think that the way the world is set up is that there are certain people who were meant to connect with and others that were not. So we should connect with the people that we are meant to connect with. That's kind of my simple philosophy. <laughs> and, you know, Watch and out, also, there, well, there's also an opportunity cost because you, sometimes you say yes to business that's not particularly profitable. So let's say normally, and I'm just, you know, using time as an example here, let's say you charge you know, $500 an hour for your time and you you feel like you want to book the business, uh, so you charge two fifty, and you break it down. But then you get frustrated because you don't really like working with that client, and you're charging less than you want to charge. But that means you just lost two hundred fifty dollars an hour uh, because you could have booked business at the full price. Mm. You know, and you might have to work a little bit harder to go get it, make a couple more calls, a couple more hours, a couple more meetings, whatever it is. But it'll be worth it. It'll pay off in the end. Yeah. And when you first started out in business, I mean, and you felt that it was, uh, if you can just be in service to others, if you can just be helpful to others, then the rest would sort of fall into place. Yeah, I did. How, how, how did that work out? That way. No, it didn't work. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't work at all. It was just like when I was an actor, I was like, well, I'm, you know, relatively attractive. I'm talented. I have good training. I tend to be charming. People will just hire me. And the same thing when I went into business on my own, I'm like, oh, I serve my customers. I work hard. I know what I'm talking about most of the time. This should be no problem. I feel, I feel, like, I feel like there's a nugget. I feel like there's some wisdom in there somewhere. That we, it's <laughs> coming. Yeah. No, but then I realized that, no, you know what? Part of our job is to go out and earn that business. So that means you need to learn how to promote yourself. There are, there's a mindset associated with it and there is a skill set associated with it. It means you need to learn how to have sales conversations. There's a mindset associated with it and there's a skill set associated with it. There are so many different things that we need to learn that we are just not entitled to business. We're not entitled to people paying us things. We're not entitled to anything. I'm not entitled to marry Amy. I've got to earn that. I got to work for that. And if I want, you know, to keep the relationship going, I've got to keep earning that. So, so I think when you take the attitude that you're entitled to things, then you don't, you know, I mean, I don't know. You could do very well. I'm sure it happens. I, I, I like to stay away from absolutes. It's one of the things I talk about in Steal the Show, especially if you're, especially if you're giving speeches because, well, I'm sorry especially if you're giving speeches, because if you, if you use absolutes and you say, everybody does this or everything is this way, then what you're saying is all generalities are true and they're not sure. just like if I said, all generalities are false, that wouldn't be true either. <laughs> <clears throat> if I said, and I was giving a speech, say, or even here, if I said, listen, nobody in the world would like earwax flavored ice cream. <laughs> it's likely that most people wouldn't like earwax, earwax flavored ice cream, but you never know. There might be some people out there who like earwax flavored ice cream. And, you know, because I remember Fritz in grammar school who used to stick his fingers in his ears and then put it in his mouth. <laughs> So, you know, maybe, maybe he would like it. Maybe that's, you know, something that he'd go for. Um, but you might think, you know, I don't know if that's really true. Somebody might like earwax flavored ice cream. And then I've lost my credibility. Now that's obviously an extreme example. People might let me get away with it, but many of the things that we talk about, especially as teachers, um, you know, have alternative, uh, perspectives, you know, have alternative uh, viewpoints or people hold those different perspectives or viewpoints. So I just think it's important to allow those other viewpoints in. And when we do, 
we actually close the holes in our arguments. Yeah. It's counterintuitive. You would think you're opening it up because you're opening up for other perspectives, but actually you're help closing the holes because people will often, usually pay more attention to you when you leave room for other ideas. So you notice how even then I said people will usually, because they won't always, but they will usually or often. Sure. So we'll change our language. They'll say, look, it seems like this often occurs. Uh, what I've found is that many people do this, or even most people when they, you know, if the data suggests it. So. Yeah, it's interesting. They, and what, what is one thing all our listeners can do today that will have a massive positive effect on their lives? Mm. I'd say do the thing that's been scaring you. Do the thing that's been scaring you. And go by, steal the show. That would be the most impactful thing you could possibly ever do. And I will use an absolute there. <laughs> <laughs> and which book has had the biggest impact on your life and why? Well, in all seriousness, Book Yourself Solid, my first book had the biggest impact on me because it changed my entire business. But the, the book that has been written, uh, was written by somebody else that had the biggest impact on me was uh, John uh, Bogle's book. Um, and the title is simple, uh, li a little, a uh, little book of investing. I forget the exact title. I'm, I'm so sorry, but it's a little red book and it's by uh, John Bogle, who is the founder of Vanguard, which holds three, tr $3 trillion dollars in assets. It's a nonprofit investment company. And, uh, I'm a bogglehead, which means that I subscribe to his investment philosophy and it changed my life. And as a result, it's going to change my future. Amazing. And last but not least, where can we send people? How can they find out more about you and your work and all your books? Right now, a great place to go is stealtheshow.com, stealtheshow.com, because when you launch a book, you give away the farm. So you can go to stealtheshow.com and you can get bonuses galore, free courses, tickets to live events. There, there's even a special bonus package with tickets to my wedding. <laughs> I don't know why anybody would want to go, but there will be some actually pretty influential people in the business, but that's a ridiculous one. Nobody's going to take that. Uh, but it's a lot of really great stuff you can get over there. Templates uh, for, for crafting your speeches, uh, toolkits for your production, uh, and so much more. Michael, thank you so, so much for talking to me today. I really, really appreciate it. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure. <laughs>